My name is Kelsey Kuykendall, and I just teamed up with the CAD. I reached out to them because I wanted to find a way to talk to artists about their practices, material processes, and conceptual interests in the socially distanced space of COVID-19. So I got on some now very ubiquitous video call software and contacted my favorite artists. Everyone I talk to is someone whose work I love, people I wanted to hear more from and meet for myself, at least online. The way they approached their work, their backgrounds and identities were all incredibly diverse. Each artist had their own unique story to share. And with that in mind, I created this five artist series of interviews. Today, we're talking with Meisha Mohammadi. and this is CAD Calls with Kelsey. Oh my gosh! So um, today we're talking with artist Meisha Mohammadi. She's a Los Angeles-based painter working in uh, lyrical abstraction. Today we get into her practice, um, her conceptual background, uh, what the transition from neuroscience to painting looked like for her, and some of her fascinations like 1950s cookbooks and vintage Farsi dictionaries. All right, I'm excited to get in the studio and have this conversation with Meisha. Let's get started. you a little bit about your background in neuroscience and both how that has affected your practice conceptually speaking but also what that transition looked like and how you got into painting. I always loved science um, and I've thought a little bit more about this since you had uh, first expressed your interest in understanding my trajectory and I do remember that seeing the original Jurassic Park made a big impact on me because the scientists you know in that movie they find this chunk of amber that well okay i haven't seen it in like 15 years but i think the dna of the dinosaur is in the amber mm -hmm. and then i remembered that um that storyline was actually based on the research of an actual scientist at cal poly san luis obispo which is oh, where wow. i grew up uh -huh. um, and then i ended up writing a letter to him and working in his lab a little bit as an intern when I was in high school. So I'd completely forgotten about that. Um, but I always loved that aspect of discovery and kind of inventing your own rules and finding out about something that nobody else knows about. That always really, really appealed to me, um, the discovery and the hunt. And so I always took, you know, every science class I could in high school and um, again it was just so fascinating to me and as i did as i advanced and did better in those classes uh, i was entrusted with more responsibility i just love that kind of thing like having access to kind of these objects and the beakers and all of that stuff um, so i always took science i knew i wanted to be a scientist i also really secretly wanted to be an artist but never had the confidence to do it I just didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know anybody in real life who was a professional working artist. Um, and so I never took that seriously, even though I did take ceramics and drawing and painting in high school. Mm -hmm. So I pursued science. I got a degree in cognitive science, specializing in neuroscience from UC San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I still really loved it at that point. Um, and I just took the next logical step, which was to apply for PhD programs. And I started a PhD program in neuroscience. And that's when I realized, I don't think I can do this as a career. Mm -hmm. Because at that level, your question, your inquiry becomes so narrow. So mm -hmm. I was always interested in big questions. For example, what is consciousness? Why are we here? How is it that points of light that are hitting my eyeball 
are translating into meaning for me, like, like a sensation of meaning for me in my brain and soul. Um, but when you're getting a PhD, you become an expert in a very narrow topic and studying one single neural pathway was not very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so I just knew in that moment I wanted to be an artist. So um, I did everything I could to be an artist. I took, cl I audited classes at mm -hmm. Tufts State and um, got really obsessed with figure drawing mm -hmm. and just sort of doggedly pursued the craft. I actually want to touch on something that you just said about um, the eye because the anatomy of the eye and the function of seeing is something that you've been talking about a little bit recently. Well I think for me so one of the best compliments anyone can give me when they look at my work is that they feel the composition is sort of bizarre they can't really make sense of what they're looking at and I think I'm able to do that because I understand how the visual system works. I understand that it's points of light hitting the back of your retina, which mm -hmm. get translated to other areas of the brain mm -hmm. until it translates into, for example, my looking at this screen and seeing you in front of me and understanding what that means. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm able to kind of dissect the visual field in front of me and understand that it is really points of light. I feel that I'm not bound by the rectangle the way maybe someone else would be. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not romantic to me. So I think because of that, I'm able to really take other risks with my rectangle, you know, walk around it, just do things that maybe someone else wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, that's the major thing that translates because of my past training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also have developed this very specific sort of intimate and frenetic language of mark making, um, which is really beautiful and fascinating. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about where that inspiration comes from and how you developed that language. Um, one thing that I've known since grad school is I very badly wanted to make meaningful marks. So. I did not know how to do this at all, but I, the impulse to make a mark that was meaningful and believable mm -hmm. really is at the crux of abstract work. So somebody has to look at your surface and really believe that A, that mark was made with intention and B, that it means something. And the viewer may not need to know what it means. That was something really important for me to discover. Mm -hmm. um, but. I knew that was the task at hand for me, wanting to be an abstract artist. I approach that in a lot of different ways. What I've been doing most recently in the past several years is using different handbooks. Um, specifically, I have a Persian English dictionary. Mm -hmm. That's a vintage dictionary from the 1950s. And it has, it's for children. So it has little drawings and doodles. Mm -hmm. And then it'll have the Farsi script and the English translation with the various meanings of the word written out in English. Mm -hmm. And I speak Farsi if, if forced. I'm not very good at it. Um, I understand everything mm -hmm. and I cannot read or write. So for me, that Farsi script really presents as a symbol and I can really appreciate it for the calligraphic quality of the line. And mm -hmm. so what I'll do is if, I know a painting is going to be about a particular concept or emotion or just experience that's going on in my life. I'll make a list of words that have to do with those ideas and then I'll look them up in the dictionary and then I'll basically dissect pieces of the Farsi script and recombine them. So I think that calligraphic line is, I mean, that was my first instruction into shaping my understanding of aesthetics is seeing that written word around my home. Even my mom, when she would write in English, the lines of her English lettering have a flair that looks like the Farsi script. And that's something I've been doing in my work for a while is creating my own symbols that I would repeat and put onto the surface. 
And so for the last couple of years, I've been actually sourcing the line segments from that dictionary and other places too. Um, I have two young children, so seeing their drawings is pretty inspiring, though I'll never pull directly and put their drawing on the surface. It's just another inspiring line to look at that's in my world. But I'm not going to be as direct about it as I am with this dictionary or other source material. Or, you know, sometimes I look at photos and even just landscape, and I think that structure in my visual environment comes in. And mm -hmm. that's where I'm getting a lot of my marks. Um, mm -hmm. But then I also pull from there and kind of extrapolate larger marks, larger swoops of color. So then how is the structure of the painting determined? When I make that first mark, I use this stick with a pencil attached to it, and it, the painting's flat on the floor. And those first marks where I'm swooping graphite across the sur all across the surface, that's how the structure of the painting is determined. So that first point of contact, which could be two to 10 strokes with that stick, really set the painting on its course. Like I remember with this line here, I saw this kind of moving. Like I saw it being put on there before I did it. I've been making these one at a time and I do that because I really want to invest in this single world that I'm creating on this one surface. And I don't want to think about how it matches or goes with the other ones that are next to it. And I never, ever make a mark unless I absolutely have to. Sometimes I just punch the painting. Sometimes I need to punch the painting. I don't want to use the same 10 muscle movements in each painting. If I start doing that, it's going to be dreadfully boring for me. When I start these, it's scary in the sense that I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, but I think I purposely put myself there so that I can do something new and fresh, but also you know, utilize the skills I've developed. And you've been inspired by um, cookbooks as well, correct? I'm pulling my lines, my marks from found material a lot of the time, and recently also my color sources. So I had collected about 30 vintage cookbooks from the 1960s and 70s when I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really looked at them. In fact, they were actually serving their purpose as, um, as stands underneath my paintings. <laughs> so my paintings wouldn't actually touch the floor. Uh -huh. And then a couple of years ago, I was like, you know, there's a reason I'm so drawn to these and the color, the color is just so gorgeous mm -hmm. and it fades sort of very beautifully over time. And yeah. I've always been drawn to those kind of primary chalky color combinations. I thought, what if I actually use these palettes um, in my work? So picking one recipe, for example, and listing mm -hmm. out all the colors and mixing them exactly and using that kind of like as a recipe for the color mm -hmm. on the surface. And this interest also coincided with your entry into motherhood, correct? So I think that it's all, it's all bound up. Um, mm -hmm. When I had gone to grad school, I had just gotten married um, about two months before I started. And I think that's one reason why I was really drawn to these cookbooks because I come from a traditional Persian background. Um, my husband does not <laughs> require that behavior for me at all. He's a very progressive person. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I only had the training I saw, which was my own mother cooking amazing meals, Persian food every single night, um, you know, tending to the home, keeping the home clean, just being a domestic goddess and mm -hmm. That was my training, that's what I saw. And in a lot of ways, I still aspire to many of those qualities. Um, it's just so ingrained in me. So I think those cookbooks were also an education in that kind of 1950s era feeling around a woman's duty in the home because they're not just recipes. It's not just listing out the ingredients and then the procedure to cook the, the recipe. Mm -hmm. It's an entire presentation. So 
two days before your dinner, do X, Y, and Z. The day before your dinner, thaw the meat. On the day of the dinner, set out place cards. All of these activities that have to do with presentation of the home, really, I was drawn to. And then the next, of course, the next step in that sequence of events is having children. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that it's all bound up in the way my life looks right now with two young children. So your experience in the world seems to really inform a lot of this work. For this one in particular, I had this very powerful feeling that I wanted to make a painting just about myself because I don't think I've ever really done that, even though these are all about me um, and my experience in the world. I, I had never specifically said, I'm going to make a painting about myself or just the self. So that's what I wanted this to be about. And it really, the title is Self-Determination on PCH Northbound. It really became about because that's my commute, so I, I always drive on PCH to get here. I don't know, I think other people do this, but when you're driving and you kind of um, replay yourself over and over again, either in past, current, or future scenarios, and there's this kind of soothing, uh, self-actualized phenomenon that happens. It's an opportunity to get to know yourself better while driving, and especially along the coast. Because I think unless you are looking at an image and trying to replicate it exactly, how can you not be absorbing the world around you? My wanting to record that moment in my life, a desire to record or document. Um, I mean, I made a painting after my second boy was born called the prestige of having boys because in Persian culture historically it's very exciting to have a son and um, I know in days of yore sons were valued and so that was my expression of documenting that moment in my life of knowing that I was going to be a woman with two boys. What I think is really fascinating about your work as a whole is that you are essentially dealing in an economy of symbolism, but you're doing so within the realm of, of lyrical abstraction, which I think is really unusual. And it might be more, um, more obvious to choose something more illustrative. And I'm wondering what led you to this way of working? What led you to this style? I've never wanted to say something very specific. Mm -hmm. in terms of, um, I've just never wanted to, I want to talk about specific ideas and concepts, but I always felt very resistant to laying it out so clearly. Mm -hmm. I love poetry, I love suggestion, and I also, in the spirit of generosity to my viewer, I want to give space to my viewer to match my energy. You know, I want to invite them into this viewing experience. And to me, that's more challenging for me um, when saying something so specific like you would in a representational painting or an illustrative painting. For me, that would just lock down the meaning too tightly. And mm -hmm. I never wanted to do that. How then um, do you respond to what viewers might project onto these works? I feel like I am the caretaker of these paintings. To me, this is about this rectangle in space at that finished moment in time. If somebody's interest is reflecting on that surface in relationship to what's going on in their own head, Again, I see that as a gift. They're sharing something about themselves with me. That's very special. That's a very generous perspective. I went through a shift. I specifically understood that these are meant to be out in the world and that when I make this, something is healed or expelled or expressed in me that I don't need to look at anymore. And it's actually a little bit horrifying to look at it. So once I it made that shift in my mentality about them, I think that fostered this kind of thinking. 
wow, these are really, really beautiful. Um, okay, well, I just want to end by asking what you've got going on right now, where we can see oh. you. Um, go ahead and plug your website, your Instagram if you want to, and just let us know where we can see you mid-pandemic. So I have my solo show, I Am the Oncoming Voices, is up at Halsey McKay Gallery in East mm -hmm. Hampton until August 23rd. And um, you can see my work on my website, MeshaMohammadi.com or my Instagram at MeshaMohammadi. And that's a really good place to follow what I'm doing because I'll always post, you know, what I have coming up. And I'm really excited because I am leading a, an activism workshop at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the ICALA. So I submitted a proposal a few weeks ago and they accepted it. And I'm really excited because I'm co-hosting with Laura Owens and Lisa Diane Wedgworth. And we are starting the process of building a database of BIPOC abstractionists. Yes, thank you so much, Misha. That is super, super exciting. Um, obviously, she's got a lot of great stuff in the works that we can go check out um, even in COVID times. And make sure to check her out on her Instagram and her website, um, which I am also going to link in the description. Let us know in the comments if there's anyone else you want us to interview and what kind of questions you want to hear from your favorite artists. All right, guys, thank you so much, and I'll see you next time on Cad Calls with Kelsey.